our reading this morning is Psalm, uh, Psalm 8. And Psalm 8 reads, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the, earth, of the seas. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. All right, we have um, our next monologue here. I, I hope he's ready, and we'll be here in just a second. There we go. There we go. I never fully realized what it meant to be able to see. I walked in darkness every day, having been born blind. Spent most of my days begging for alms. There wasn't much else for a blind man to do. People looked down on me because of my blindness. I overhear remarks. It's his fault he was born blind. He must have committed some horrible sin or because of his parents. What did they do? Made me feel like dirt, like mud. I suffered in silence. Some days I felt blind in more ways than one. I had no idea what the future would hold. It seemed I had no purpose in life except to be here as some sort of punishment for some sort of unknown sin. But then Jesus saw me, and what he said and did next changed my life forever. It was an ordinary day. I had taken up my usual spot in the city gate, and a steady stream of people walked by many ignoring my pleas and my open palm. I heard a small group approaching and heard the familiar question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I prepared myself for the humiliation for another biting remark, but the response surprised me. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. What? I was born so that God's work might be displayed through me. I heard the gasps, the questions, and then I heard someone spit on the ground. What was going on? And then someone touched me, smearing something all over my eyes. It was mud. It was him. It was Jesus. How he spoke with such authority as he bathed my eyes with mud. Go, he told me. Wash in the pool of Siloam. I went. I didn't know what to expect, but he said that God had a plan. Those were the words of hope I had never received before. Of course I would go. When I came up out of those waters, nothing could have prepared me for what happened. Light filled my vision. I could see. I could see. I knew right then that Jesus had a, must be a prophet sent from God. I wanted to learn from him to be his disciple. Nothing would keep me from declaring his praise, even when it meant being driven from the synagogue. And then Jesus stood before me and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? I asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. He spoke. You have seen him, in fact. He is the one speaking with you. I fell before Jesus in worship. Lord, I believe. I believe. Thank you. Silly little con- confession to make here. I'm so excited that I got the order of service right this morning. <laughs> After a little mix up last week. Um, at, at home, we've been getting into a TV show on Netflix called The Repair Shop. It's kind of a, a neat little show where. Um, the premise of the show is that we live in a throwaway society, but, but some items we just don't want to throw away when they break or when they're damaged. 
Um, so many things. We, we use them up until they're broken and we throw them away and we replace them. But there are some things that are like family heirlooms or antiques, things that have a special meaning to us that, that we don't want to throw away. So, so what do we do with those? I, I know we usually hang on to them in our attic or something until we pass away and let the kids worry about what to do with them. But, but this TV show has these, these restoration specialists that, that will fix whatever it is that might be broken. Uh, it's, it's filmed in the Weald and Downland Living Museum in Sussex, England, and it's, it's really cool. They have a barn out behind the museum, and, and in the barn they have all these workstations set up for the various restoration specialists, and it's, it's really interesting to, to, to watch the show as it, as it goes through. Somebody will bring in an item that's been damaged, that's been in the family for generations, and they share the story of how that item came to be in the family and, and why is it special to someone. And, and then they'll, uh, the show walks through the restoration process. How do they actually repair it? Because some things are really fascinating. Um, and, and then they show at the end when it's working fantastic, and they, uh, they, they show the reunion with the, with the people that brought it in. Uh, and they get to see for the first time that thing that means so much to them that they thought was ruined forever, looking next to new again. Uh, it's really an interesting show. They've, they've tackled projects like antique vases. Uh, apparently, Picasso used to do ceramics before the painting or during the whatever, but they had a Picasso vase there one time, and the person had no idea that, that that was a Picasso work. They just knew it's been in the family for generations, and and it had fallen off the mantle, and they, they came to see if they could get it fixed. And uh, it was kind of interesting to hear about that story. Um, but it's really interesting. Um, one week, there was a valuable painting that was hanging on the wall, and they had a recliner in front of it and an end table and a, and a lamp. And somehow when the guy reclined, uh, a lamp had fallen into the picture, and, and there was like a 10-inch tear in this picture. And it was special to him because it was his grandfather's and his grandfather had spent a lot of time in sea. That's, that was his occupation. He was, um, worked in some of those ships and, and things. And, and this meant a lot to him. And the picture was this deep sea fog, this pea souper, they called it. This pea soup fog. And, and there was the, kind of the outline of the big ship and the fog. And then there's these two guys sitting in a rowboat going out to the ship. And, and they, they cleaned up that picture really good. And she repaired the rip. And you'd never know. It was ripped. Um, fantastic job that they did. Um, and that's kind of typical of the work that they do. It could be, could be ceramic piece, a teddy bear handed down. There was, there was one week there was a, a teddy bear that, uh, that this person who was now in her 70s or 80s, uh, her grandmother, the story behind this was that her grandmother had that in a concentration camp during the Second World War. And, and as a little girl in a concentration camp. Fortunately, the war ended before, uh, before she was killed, but, um, but she saw her parents go into a gas chamber and never come out again. So um, that little teddy bear was with her every day at that time and, and meant so much to her grandmother. And now the, the, the lady, the granddaughter is in her 80s and having this teddy bear, um, all she has of her grandmother in a concentration camp, and, and it was neat to see the care that they take, because hearing the story, it's not just a teddy bear anymore. It, it has that sentimental value, and the people restoring that uh, can, can, can get a, a glimpse of that value, and they, they really take good care of it uh, to bring it back to life. Now, last week, we're in the second Sunday of Lent, and, and last week, if you remember, we looked at Genesis chapter 2, and we saw how... Adam was in the garden and he could eat from the fruit of any tree in the garden except the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and of course, they were deceived into eating that fruit and, and a curse followed. And a part of that curse was death, both spiritual death, which happened immediately, and physical death, which happened later. But there were, there were other parts of that curse too. And, and no part of life was left unchanged for Adam and Eve. That changed everything. Uh, suffice it to say uh, that it created a major rift, a major tear in the relationship between God and man. A, a tear that's still there today. 
But the question is, can it be fixed? Can it be fixed? Can we be restored to original condition? And, and I think to look at that question, we're going to take a peek at, at why we were created in the first place. Why is it? Um, what, what does it mean to be human? Uh, and, and, you know, it's going to be a really quick look because people have been looking at that question for probably since Adam and Eve were probably sitting over coffee in their fig leaves one day wondering why, what it means to be human. Uh, if not, maybe their children because it's a question as, as old as time. What does it really mean to be human? Why were we created in the first place? Uh, and certainly philosophers and theologians have been wrestling with that question and, and we're not going to do much more than scratch the surface this morning, but at least we'll scratch the surface. At least we'll get a taste from Psalm 8, why we were created and what it means to be human. Uh, and we'll find that glimpse uh, in our reading. Uh, in order to understand what it means to be human, we should start, at least King David would say we should start with uh, some of the things that we saw in the reading. And specifically, we saw... Um, Things like that, that we were made just a little bit lower than the angels. That we were crowned with glory and honor. That we have dominion over all the earth, the flocks and the herds, the birds and the fish. Uh, all have been placed at our feet. We have dominion over all created things. As you reflect on this and you think about this, reflect on the idea that we were created in God's image. You know, I thought it was fantastic when Mike spoke about uh, kind of that reflection of, of Jesus in the mirror uh, from Wednesday's devotion. Uh, that's really the idea of being created in God's image. We have been made, created as image bearers. That's a part of why we were created. It's a part of what it means to be human. We are, uh, human beings were created to be God's image bearers for the rest of creation. Now, what is an image bearer? What do I mean by that term, image bearer? In, in the ancient days, if a king or an emperor were to uh, invade a foreign country, he would often set up his image, a statue or some kind of likeness of his, and, and he would set that up in the, in the city that was conquered or the nation that was conquered so that the people of that city or nation would see that image and know that he was now their ruler. Kind of that image of the king. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I've seen this in, in communist countries. In fact, I think I got a picture of, um, yeah, that's in China. A huge image of their, keep walking into that, I should walk over here. Huge image of their emperor in a public square. And I've, I've seen that several times. So apparently in several cities in China, they have these huge portraits, I guess, these huge images of, of their leader, their emperor. I've seen that in North, Carol uh, North Korea and in Cuba, too. So I, I guess maybe it's one of those things we usually see in uh, communist countries. That's where I've noticed it the most. I think we Americans would really freak out if we tried to do that here, put up huge pictures of President Trump in our public places. I think that would create quite a stir. That's, that's not in our culture to do that. It's not culturally acceptable. So um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. But, but think with me for a minute, that image of being an a image bearer, God's image bearer, that's really a big part of Adam and Eve's role in the garden. They were to be, they were to be the testimony of God in the garden. All created things could look upon Adam and Eve and see God's justice, his mercy, his love through Adam and Eve. They were the image bearers. Back to Psalm 8, we see another reason why we were created, and that's uh, the very first verse says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic was your name in all the earth. David is worshiping God. Augustine, who was probably the fourth, early 4th fourth century, uh, Augustine of Hippo, for Leroy, he would know the difference, but uh, Hippo was a city in, in North Africa, and, and he was one of the leading uh, bishops in the day, one of the more powerful, more understanding 
very intelligent, very smart person. Augustine was the one that came up with the idea of the, uh, uh, the Trinity. You know, it's, it's in the Bible, it's all over the Bible, but nowhere is it really put together in a cohesive way. So Augustine put that together and, and kind of talked about the Trinity in a way that we could hopefully better understand it. Um, he, he also said, he, he wrote at one point that, uh, that at the primary level, human beings are lovers. We relate to the world around us through love. And, and as we come together to worship, we're expressing our love for God. That's what worship is. We're expressing our love for God. Sometimes get off on a little side note. Sometimes I hear that people don't get anything out of worship. Well, we're not really worshiping you. We're, we're showing or expressing our love to God. So as a side benefit, we often do get something out of it. But our purpose for coming together is to express our love for God. And we do that through worship. But then in verses 4, four through 6, uh, I'm sure you heard those. And I want to read those again because I sense a little bit of a, of a difficulty there. And he says, you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. Now, as I was thinking about this last week, I I have to admit that crowning us with glory and honor, that's not been my experience in life. Has that been your experience? Have you really felt the glory and honor of God as, as you live your life? To me, and, and maybe if you're a little bit honest with yourselves, if you're anything like me, uh, you, you'll admit that I often feel more guilt and shame than I do the glory and honor of God in my life. Um, don't we? Don't, don't we feel more guilt and shame than we do God's glory and honor? Um, as Paul wrote in, in, in fact, I'm going to turn to that really quickly here. In Romans chapter 7, Paul wrote, I know that nothing good lives in me. And this is the Apostle Paul. This is the guy that wrote half of the New Testament. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. Um, and, and that falling short of what we want to do causes guilt. Augustine says we have the desire to worship, the desire to, um, to be worshipers, to be lovers of God. But the issue is we often worship the wrong things. We often love the wrong things. We love created things rather than the creator. And, and, and we worship these created things and we love these created things as if they're the ultimate reality. And, and so we fall short of what the ultimate reality really is. And every time we do that, uh, we feel more guilt and shame. We were created for so much more, weren't we? We were created for, uh, to be image bearers of God. But the image that we reflect ever since the fall has gotten a little tarnished, hasn't it? Now, don't get me wrong. God is not tarnished. And God's image is not tarnished. But God's image as reflected through us is we aren't adequately reflecting God's image as we did before the fall. Think of a mirror. A mirror represents or reflects whatever faces it, right? Whatever is turned toward it, that mirror will reflect. And originally, human beings were created in the image of God as as if looking straight into a mirror. We were filled completely with God. And so we reflected an accurate image of God. But sin is the turning away from God. And when Adam and Eve ate the fruit they weren't supposed to eat, and sin entered the world, it's like we turned to face 
the wrong things. We turned away from God and we turned towards sin. And now we're no longer adequately reflecting the image of God like we were before the, law, the, the fall. Now, I, I see some good news here too because David's psalm, while in the Psalms, looks backward toward the creation of mankind. That same verse, or, or some of those same verses, are quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, chapter 2 or 10. I'm apparently lost, so I'll just keep going. Those same verses are, are quoted in Hebrews, and I'm sure it's chapter 2. Um, yeah, Hebrew 2. It says, What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You put everything under his feet. An exact quote from Psalm chapter 8. Only while King David wrote about the creation of mankind, the author of Hebrews points toward the son of man, points toward Jesus Christ, that that was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So what I think he means by that is that Jesus is the true human being. He's the full image of what we were called to be. He is crowned with glory and honor. All the works of God's hands are under his rule. He is the true image of the invisible God. Where we failed to fully and accurately represent God, Jesus got it right. Jesus succeeded. Jesus fully accomplishes the task or the calling that Adam and Eve were given in the Garden of Eden. So where does that leave us? What do we do? In our broken state, in our tarnished godly image, what is there for us? What's left? Where do we go? We were originally created in God's image, but that image of God has been broken in us we no longer perfectly reflect God's image. We need repair. And, and the repair shop, the TV show, doesn't have a specialist for that. So where do we go? Well, in our monologue, Randy gave us an idea. The man who was born blind shows us where we go. The man who was born blind was broken. He needed healing. He needed restoration. Being born blind, he'd never seen a day in his life. He'd never actually seen anything in his life. Desperate for healing, but unsure where to go. Until he winds up at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus heals him. So what do we need to do? We need to wind up at the feet of Jesus. And we need to ask for that same healing. We need to truly humble ourselves and come before Jesus to truly see our need for healing and he will heal us. We were originally created in God's image but that image has become broken. Hebrews gives us the answer in a couple of verses later. It says, Now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Because Jesus died we might live. Jesus, now crowned with glory, first humbled himself and became the true human being for us. Even bearing an undeserved crown of thorns, our crown of thorns, the crown of thorns that we deserved. And Jesus ex exchanged that crown of thorns, his, he exchanged his crown of glory and came to earth and wore our crown of thorns, our crown of shame. He bore the guilt for us so that we might go forth and be truly human again, that we might again put on the image of God, the image, become image bearers of God. That's what that verse means, to be, um, to be clothed in Christ, that we might put on the image of God We've all sinned, not just Adam. We've all been born in sin. 
Uh, that whole idea of original sin is a real thing. We experience the effects of Adam and Eve's sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory. So it wasn't just Adam's sin that we're facing because we've all done it too. We've picked up the mantle and we've run with it quite well. And we can't help it. There's nothing we can do about it. We can't save ourselves. We can't restore or repair ourselves any more than the, the man born blind could heal himself. Any more than a 250 year old antique clock on the repair shop could fix itself. We need a savior. We need someone who can fix us. We need someone who perfectly represents the image of God. We need Jesus. Romans 10.13 says that, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that saved is one of those Christian terms that, that has kind of come under a little bit of baggage. Uh, what does it mean to be saved? It means to be fixed. It means to be repaired, restored. We can be made the way we were supposed to be through a right relationship with Jesus. Acts 2.21 says the exact same thing. For all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And a little bit later in verse 38 he says, um, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent. Turn back to God. Turn away from the sin and turn back to God. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in Him with your life. And you can once again reflect God's image. His love, His mercy, His righteousness, His justice. Unlike the clock or anything else on the repair shop, we can't be restored without our permission. I mean, you don't have to ask a clock if it wants to be fixed, right? We don't have to ask that for permission. But, but God has to ask us for permission to work in our lives. So we need to humble ourselves. And we need to ask the Lord to fix us. We need to give him work, give him permission to do that healing work in our hearts. We need to ask him for that. And we need, we need to look to him in all things that we might truly once again become his image bearers. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your son Jesus Christ. We thank you that, that while we went astray that Jesus came and showed us what a life honoring you is supposed to look like what a life made in your image is supposed to look like. And we pray, Father, that we can learn that lesson, that we could turn to Jesus and be healed and be repaired and fixed and saved. And we thank you that he can do that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.